A girl takes off out of nowhere, leading investigators on a long road trip that ends with a crashed jeep, scattered belongings, and a girl who was never seen again. This is the peculiar story of the disappearance of Leah Roberts, who has been missing since March of 2000. Welcome to Peculiar Occurrences. I am your host, Lilith Nova. Leah Roberts was born in 1976, the youngest of three children living in the suburbs of Durham, North Carolina. When she was 17 and just starting her studies at North Carolina University, in 1995, her father was diagnosed with a chronic lung illness. This put a great strain on the family. Then when Leah was 20 years old and a sophomore in college, her mother suddenly died of heart disease. In the fall of 1998, she returned to school after taking some time off. It was at this time that she had to be hospitalized after a car accident where she punctured her lung and shattered her femur. That would be the bone that runs down the thigh. Surgeons had to insert a metal rod in order to help it heal right along the femur. She told her sister Kara later that when she saw the truck coming at her, she thought she was going to die. This became a life-changing cha epiphany, and she decided she wanted to take some time off college and live life to the very fullest. In the spring of 1999, just three weeks before she was scheduled to leave for Costa Rica, her father suddenly died. Despite this, Roberts decided to continue with the field program and go to Costa Rica anyways. And since she was leaving the country and no longer had parents, she granted her sister Kara power of attorney over her bank accounts, where some money that she had inherited from her parents had been deposited. With her degree in Spanish and anthropology almost complete, she decided to drop out of school. Kara and her brother Heath tried to talk her into sticking it out for six more months. But she would not change her decision. Her sister Kara was noted saying that she thought she had felt lost. She ended up learning how to play the guitar and taking up photography as a hobby. And she got a pet kitten that she named Bay. She started hanging out in local coffee houses, writing poetry in her journal about the meaning of life and making new friends in the process. With one of them being Janine Quiller and with her roommate, Nicole Bennett. She discussed emulating the idea of Beat Generation author, and I may not pronounce this right, so I'll put the name here, Jack Kuryuk? That's probably completely wrong. The point was she wanted to go on a road trip to the West. On the morning of March 9th, 2000, Leah had talked to her sister Kara on the phone about future plans, but they had made no concrete commitments. But Kara recalls that the phone call ended with them agreeing that they would see some see each other in some fashion in the near future. Later that afternoon, Leah and Nicole had agreed to do some babysitting the next day. The roommate went out to her job and returned later to find that Leah's 1993 white Jeep Cherokee was not there and neither was Leah. Her roommate thought nothing of it at the time, as Leah was coming and going at all hours as she pleased and just enjoying life since she was no longer in school and living off of her inheritance. However, Leah never showed up to the babysitting job the next day and didn't show up to the apartment that night, which the roommate found very peculiar. By the end of the following day, March 11th, not only was Leah still missing, but friends and family who had prior plans with her had started calling looking for her. Nico finally told Leah's sister, Kara, what had happened on Monday, March 13th. And Kara notified the Durham police that she was missing. 
There wasn't much the police could do at the time since Leah was over 18 years old, she wasn't a child, and she had talked to friends previously about taking a trip. And there's nothing illegal about taking a trip and not telling your family. So they could not list her as a missing person at that time. The next day, Kara and Leah's roommate searched Leah's room. A significant amount of her clothes was missing, which suggested a lengthy trip. She also had taken her cat, Bay, along with the cat's cat carrier. And she also left a note that stated, I'm not suicidal, I'm the opposite. She, re she tried to reassure her sister and her roommate, but then she also mentioned the name of that book, The Drama Bumps, and how her trip was inspired by this work. Along with the note, she had left a bundle of cash, approximately enough to cover a month of her expenses and her rent at the apartment. And there was an illustration on the note of the Cheshire Cat's grin which she was a very big fan of and later on her sister would start to think that this drawing might actually be more of a clue to her disappearance than they once thought. With how the Cheshire cat grins and disappears but is still there watching and waiting to reappear. And since Kara still had power of attorney over her sister's financial records, she was able to go and look at them. She discovered that Leah had actually withdrawn several thousands of dollars on March 9th. Then used her credit card to pay for a hotel room near Memphis, Tennessee. Later purchases was either of gas or food and suggested that she was heading down Interstate 40, traveling west, then north on Interstate 5, till she reached the I-40 Western Inn in California. And after a gas purchase shortly after midnight on the morning of March 13th in Brooks, Oregon, all activity on Leah's account ended. And to understand why her sister was heading to California, Kara and Susie Smith, Leah's very best friend, headed, headed down to the coffee shop that she frequented. There they found Janine Quiller. She had talked a lot about Jack's books with her friend and especially one called The Derma Bums, a 1958 novel, a sequel to the better known On the Road, where he had worked for a time as a U.S. Forest Service fire lookout on in the Northern Cascade Mountains in Washington State, where he was profoundly affected by the beauty of the landscape. Leah had expressed interest in seeing that area for herself. Kara felt relieved thinking she knew what her sister's plans were, but became worried because she really thought her sister would call her on her birthday to wish Kara a happy 26th birthday, which would have been on March 18th. Instead, she got a note in her mail slot from the Durham County Police Department telling her to call their counterparts in Whatcom County Sheriff's Office in Bellingham, Washington. She, did, she then found out that earlier that day, Leah's Jeep had been found in a remote part of the forest, but Leah was not with it. The Jeep had been discovered at Canyon Creek Road, a side route of Mount Baker Highway, just a short distance south of the Canadian border. Joggers in the area had noticed clothes thrown all about on a sharp, tur sharp curve of the road. Some had even been tied to tree branches as if somebody was trying to use them to get someone's attention. At the bottom of a steep embankment was Leah's Jeep, badly damaged. From the path the car took and the extensive damage to the vehicle, police had determined that the vehicle had to be moving at about 40 miles per hour when it went off the embankment and down the slope. The way things were tossed around inside was consistent with the Jeep rolling over several times. Yet there was absolutely no blood or any other signs to injury uh, of the occupant. There was no shattered glass or stretching of the seat belt as if someone had been in the driver's seat. 
it seemed possible that no one might have been in the Jeep when it crashed, that this could have actually been staged. Blankets and pillows were hung inside the window, suggesting that the car may have been lived in for a while after it was crashed. Leah's passport, checkbook, credit cards, license clothes, CDs, and other belongings were found scattered all around the woods in the area. Bits of cat food and a cat carrier were found in the vehicle, confirming that Leah had taken Bay with her on the trip. Although the cat has never been found either. Although valuables such as $2,500 in a pants pocket were found on the scene, suggesting that robbery had not been the cause of the accident or setup of accident. Kara and her brother Heath flew to Birmingham to assist in the investigation. Bellingham. I said Birmingham. I meant Bellingham. They visited the crash site and with the help of the police created a flyer with, in which they posted around town. And while going through Leah's things, they found a ticket stub for March 13th showing of American Beauty, which told them around the time she may have gotten into town. This suggested that she may have spent a few hours in town before driving the four or five hours where her car was found. Near the theater was the mall's only sit-down restaurant and a place that her brother and sister both thought she might have visited. The police were led to two customers, both men, who not only recalled Leah but had sat on either side of her on that day that she was there eating. They said she talked a lot about Jack's books and her current plans. One man claimed that she had left with a third man who she called Barry and provided us a, a description for a police sketch of the man. However, neither the other man or any other customer who had been in the restaurant at that time could confirm uh, the third man being there. At a police garage where the Jeep had been towed, police continued to search the vehicle along with the FBI, which had came, became involved due to Leah having crossed state lines. Two aspects of the evidence presented to them made them think that Leah had indeed been the victim of a crime. First, the amount of money left in her pants suggested that she had spent very little in the town. Less than could be expected if she had been in the city for several days. Second, under a floor mat, they found Leah's mother's engagement ring, which she wore constantly and never took off. Her friends say that she loved the connection that it made her feel to her mother and she would never take it off. Not unless she had hit her head and forgotten who she was or was hiding it from someone else for some reason. Karen Heath returned to North Carolina working on the theory that she had hit her head and wandered off. Police searched the area where she may have wandered off for about two weeks with dogs and helicopters they found absolutely no trace and security cameras at the gas station that she had stopped at showed that she was alone although she kept peering out into the parking lot as if she may have been being followed a few days after the jeep was discovered a anonymous man called the sheriff's office and reported seeing leah what well, reported that his wife had seen leah disoriented and confused wandering around a gas station in Everett near Seattle. The man kind of freaked out when pushing for who he was and hung up, though the police still considered his tip credible and believe this may have been one of the last times Leah was ever seen alive. After the initial investigation was concluded, Leah's sister had told the police to keep the car in case additional evidence may be found years later. This turned out to be a good decision and bore fruit in 2006 when the original investigator on the case died and the case files were handed down to younger, newer detectives who discovered that her Jeep was not fully processed and decided to finish the job. It turned out that no one had ever looked underneath the hood of the Jeep, so the two pried the hood open and found that a wire to the starter relay had been cut. 
This would have allowed the car to accelerate without anyone pressing the gas pedal. Confirming earlier suspicions that no one might have been in the car when it went off that embankment. And that the car may have been purposely wrecked. They ended up finding a male's fingerprint under the hood and DNA on some of Leah's clothing. This led investigators back to the man who claimed that Leah had left the restaurant with a man named Barry, who only the second man had reported seeing. That man had worked as a mechanic and had military background, which further raised suspicions for police. He had also moved to Canada, which made it even harder for police to get DNA and fingerprints but by the time that Investigation Discovery had aired an episode about this in 2011, the DNA and fingerprints had been taken from him and they were not a match. Many people believe that foul play may have taken place and that she may have been kidnapped. Others think that she may have staged the whole thing and ran away to start a new life. Any supposed sightings of her across the United States and Canada have been reported and some think the Cheshire cat is a clue that she set this whole thing up. Some think that she hit her head, wandered off, got amnesia, and left all the valuables behind because she didn't realize they were there. Others think that she was secretly suicidal and didn't want her family to know. So she faked the accident and went off to another location to kill herself. Then I found an interesting theory on Reddit that connects this case to an unidentified doe from the same area. In 2014, a mummified body was found in the same area, well, same region. This body was apparently unrecognizable, but was apparently classified as a male, stay with me here, as a male between 33 and 55 which is quite unlike the 23-year-old Roberts. However, massive mistakes have been made on badly decayed does before, including incorrect gender ID. In any case, this doe was estimated to be at to stand 5'5 and had a metal rod implanted in the right femur. The rod's lot number was traced and the batch was apparently shipped in the fall of 1998, at the same time that Leah had her operation. And Leah Roberts is described, among other things, to be 5'6". And to have a scar on her right hip where a metal rod was inserted along the femur. At the end of 1998, following a car accident. Now, it is extremely unlikely that a body around the same height, with the same kind of surgery with a, a rod that was made and shipped around the same time Leah Roberts had her surgery would just appear in the same region that Leah Roberts disappeared and not be her. The Reddit user wrote, I see three possibilities. One, simply a wild coincidence, although they think that this is very unlikely and that that one should be ruled out by another look by authorities. Number two, mistakes were made examining the doe. This has happened before. Number three, Leah Roberts could have had some sort of intersexual condition, like being some sort of hermaphrodite or something like that. And uh, that information with her parents being gone, that information was not communicated uh, to the police department. And the, Reddit, and the Reddit user believes that this was more than enough evidence to look into both of these cases." End quote. Now, I just thought that this was just an insane case to me. There's just so many theories of what could have happened. If you know anything about Leah Roberts or this case, or would like to know more about Leah Roberts or this case, I will put a link for that down below. So what do you think about this? peculiar occurrence. What do you think happened to Leah? We went over so much that could have happened. Tell me what you think. I really want to know down in the comments below. And while you're down there, don't forget to check out my description box for your peculiar occurrence merch. 
and don't forget to share this out to all your peculiar friends hit that like button and if you're new here hit that subscribe button and become part of my peculiar squad and don't forget to hit that bell or YouTube won't even tell you that I uploaded I know crazy right also check me out on Twitter and Facebook if you want to hang out with me in between all of this and until next time Keep your eyes peeled for all things peculiar. Do 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 Are you listening? Damn. Uh. Yeah.